All set. Okay, great. So um, good morning, everybody. Um, this is the informational hearing um, with the Appropriations Committee and the Department of Administrative Services. Um, uh, they have a short um, PowerPoint uh, presentation to go through, and then we'll have time for questions. Um, Representative Walker, do you have anything to say? No, I just want to again say happy pre-Thanksgiving to everybody, and I hope everybody has a good Thanksgiving. And I look forward to this uh, this information because this is going to be affecting us dramatically in the fall, in this in the spring. So, Commissioner Jabal, you got a you got a big heavy weight to carry here. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Representative France. Are you on? I believe he said he was going to be running a little late. Sen Senator Minor, I know he was hunting last week. I don't know if he's back in town. So um, anyways, uh, if they come on, we'll have them say a few words. Uh, uh, good morning, Commissioner. Pleasure to see you here today. Thank you very much for coming on. We do have a lot of questions. Uh, we've been hearing from some of the commissioners that are having uh, an issue um, uh, answering uh, or getting staff in to do what we had given them to do in the budget. Uh, so we have those questions and that's really, and based on all the news stories lately relative to us losing three quarters of our workforce, slight exaggeration, um, you know, we're trying to make sure that we're on top of everything. So uh, commissioner, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you, Senator, and uh, and good morning to all the members of the of the committee. Um, Co-Chair Walker, great to see you as always, um, uh, and happy early Thanksgiving to everyone as well. Um, let me just start quickly with introducing other members of our team who are on the line here. Um, so, I think you heard earlier from Eleanor Michael, who is our Director of uh, Legal and Legislative Affairs at the Department of Administrative Services. Um, Nick Herms, who is the Deputy Commissioner at DAS and the state's Chief Human Resources Officer, and Michelle Gilman, who's the Deputy Chief Operating Officer uh, with me in the Office of the Governor. Um, and I think that's everybody, is that right? Yeah, okay. So um, as mentioned, we prepared some uh, charts uh, to directly answer the questions that we were provided. And I don't know, um, is someone able to pop those up for the committee members who may not have had a chance to review them. I don't know, Susan or Eleanor, if one of you perhaps could. Susan, are you still there? Susan? Yes, ma'am, I am. I can pull up, unless Eleanor has them available, I can, I can uh, give me two secs and I can pull them up. Okay. That would be great to do, Susan. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. While, while Susan's doing that, um, I'll get us started with kind of the overall Theme. So we, the agenda is we've got a couple of key themes we want to kind of just go through the, the state of where we are um, in the executive branch right now on human resources, and then we will go through one at a time all of the questions that you'd asked, and then of course save as much time as possible for your questions as well. Um, so uh, just just touching on, on the key themes, first of all, um, and for those of you who have the charts, it's page three we're on at this point. So. Um, we are now, you know, a little over a year past when we went live with the um, the new centralized HR uh, model. Um, great, thank you, Susan. And we're if you could just jump ahead to page three, that would be great. Perfect, thank you. Um, so we're so we went live in August of 2020 um, with the new model. So we're a year and a couple of months um, into this. And overall, um, it's been you know a tremendous success. Um, each of the functional areas are performing you know uh, with higher quality and greater speed and efficiency than than they had previous to the centralized model. We've been able to reinvest in some functions in HR that had previously been divested. So we'll go through all of that in a lot more detail. Um, and one one bit of uh, one proof point associated with that is that the pace of hiring is actually at its highest rate um, in the history that we've been able to piece together at least over a decade. Um, and that's despite tremendous additional work that's been placed on the HR teams 
um, as a function of a lot of COVID related disruptions that we can talk more about as well. So despite all the COVID related challenges, and I'm talking about, you know, implementation of the vaccine mandate, dealing with implementation of, you know, significantly expanded telework, um, many other COVID related factors, you know, we're still at a very high hiring rate. Now that said, um, we know that in a lot of our agencies, it doesn't feel that way right now because we are seeing uh, more retirements than, than historical. And we are also are competing in a labor market right now, which is extremely tight, as we all know, not just for the state, but for you know, employers around Connecticut and across the country. Um, so that does put additional strain on the, the hiring demands uh, that we have. Um, and then a very popular question is around retirements. Um, and we'll take you through all the data on this. The short story is that so far, Retirements are running ahead of historical trends uh, at this point in the year, but not dramatically so. So, you know, the real question is, is what are we going to see come the spring, right, as we get close to that June 30th date? Um, and will we see a significant increase? We're preparing that we will, um, because we need to prepare for kind of, you know, the most significant impacts. Um, but the point is that at least so far, we're not seeing a dramatic increase in retirements, although we are tracking above average. So we'll, we'll show you the data on that as well. Uh, if we go to the next chart, please. Okay, so a little bit of a dense chart, but there's a lot, a lot of, a lot of uh, packed in here, just kind of updating on the initiative overall for, for everyone's background. So just as a reminder, what the world looked like in the prior model, the decentralized model, when each agency was effectively operating its own little HR department. And, you know, the challenges that were faced were that, you know, we kind of lacked critical mass in, in many areas. And so, you know, people were stretched thin, they were expected to be experts on an incredibly wide array of, of topics and, uh, and, and, you know, struggled through that. Um, as a result, a lot of the processes that we have to administer in HR, either based on statute, uh, um, employee contract, or other factors, were being applied um, very inconsistently, um, and in many cases, you know, in, in not not uh, in alignment with contract or with law uh, that was creating risk for the state and creating impacts on employees. Um, we had, as a state in the past, uh, essentially divested of any centralized investments in training and development for our employees on kind of cross-cutting skills, things like becoming a, a manager, for example. You know, obviously, we're still doing training on functional specific areas, but in terms of kind of empl general employee development, that had been completely divested over, over the last decade. Um, and also, because we were operating in that siloed model, it was, it was more challenging for our team, our, our professionals, to understand, you know, what career paths could be and how they could advance their career and grow into positions of increasing responsibility. So since we've implemented this, you know, we've seen significant improvement in all of these areas. Um, you know, first of all, we talk about capacity and durability, and I mentioned the ability that we've had as a result of this model to absorb a tremendous amount of additional workload in our HR teams caused by the pandemic. Um, you know, I, I don't know, it's, it would take a long time to explain the amount of complexity that goes into implementing a vaccine mandate, for example, um, is, has been absolutely tremendous. And getting it set up, getting it implemented, and now while we're in steady state, still chasing around every week hundreds of employees who, for whatever reason, you know, are not getting their test results in, trying to figure out why that's happening, taking progressive discipline when necessary, just an enormously time-consuming activity, important from a public health and leadership perspective, but an additional burden on the team nonetheless. Uh, teleworking has been, you know, a great um, uh, er element of progress I think we've made uh, during the pandemic, uh, really much more uh, uh, aggressively em embracing telework uh, to help support how we provide services during the pandemic um, and providing, you know, keeping us competitive as a state with what a lot of private employers are doing as well. Um, but that creates a lot of additional <laughs> burden on our HR team as well to administer that in lines with uh, our agreements. Um, so in any event, we've been able to absorb all of that work on top of uh, all of the other things that we've accomplished. In terms of speed and flexibility, um, because we have these centralized, specialized groups, we're now able to load balance across agencies. So where we see 
upticks in demand for certain types of transactions or certain recruiting needs, we can redeploy resources more quickly um, to help support those. And we've done that many times uh, over the last year. Um, we've implemented a, a digital HR uh, information system. So we've, we're getting away from filing cabinets of paper of personnel records. We get those all up into the cloud. And so has many benefits, both in terms of employees being able to more easily access their own records as well as uh, HR being able to get quick access to files, and which is particularly important when people are teleworking, right? Now you don't have to go into the office to get access to all these files, you can get them online. It's also helped us um, get much more consistent and accurate records about both our personnel, but also transactions that are being processed, whether that's leaves and benefits or uh, other types of uh, programs. We're able to more effectively and consistently uh, administer the policies that we're responsible for and get the many agencies that were in an unsatisfactory state prior to centralization into a satisfactory position. We are adding new capabilities. So we're reinvesting into a central training uh, and learning to development function. Uh, we've been rolling out new online training tools to our employees. Um, we can talk more about that if you're interested. So that's a really exciting thing. Um, and then again, for, we have more defined structures so that HR employees know more clearly, you know, how to advance their career, how to gain experience in different functional areas so that they can really round out their skills and be able to contribute um, both to the state and our employees, but also to their own career progression um, as they look across their career and hopefully stay with us for the long term. So that's a, a quick flyover on, on the progress uh, that we've seen uh, since implementation. If you go to the next chart, please. Okay, so a lot of numbers here, very dense, um, but this is the summary of how many positions, when I mentioned the, the hiring that we've been doing, this is the positions that we have filled um, and the approved vacancies that are on the books currently. So the easiest way to think about this is just to go to the bottom row at the very, you know, go to the very bottom there. Um, it, the rows across the middle there are obviously splitting out the, by agency. If you're interested in a particular agency, you can look, but just in total to get kind of a sense of the trends here. The columns are the total number of positions filled by fiscal year going back over the last decade. So you can see the trend lines there, you know, starting, you know, we've been averaging, you know, 4,000, 5,000, you know, maybe touching 6,000 uh, once or twice. Um, and then you get to the gray shaded um, column. Um, the first gray shaded column is the total numbers of positions we've filled so far this fiscal year. So essentially, from July 1st through November 1st. So four months. So basically one third of the fiscal year. So what we did is we extrapolated that out. So look at the run rate, right? You basically can take that column and multiply by three. If it's one third of the year, we gross it up for what is the run rate we're on. And you can see that circled number there. We're on pace so far uh, to fill over 7,000 roles this fiscal year, which would be an all time record relative to you know what we've done at least over the last decade that is on this chart um, and we expect that pace to further accelerate frankly um, you know as we now look to fill even more roles related to some of the new programs that have come online related to cannabis or to gaming uh, when we look at the infrastructure bill that just passed both dot and deep in particular and some other agencies as well um, are going to have additional roles that we're going to want to fill to be able to quickly stand up uh, the, to the programs necessary to uh, uh, implement the, um, the uh, opportunities that were created in those bills to be competitive for some of the com competitive grant programs that were created in those uh, in the infrastructure bill. Um, so a lot to go, but basically just wanted to make sure people were clear, you know, we are hiring at a faster rate than, than essentially we have before. Now that said, we have a lot of approved vacancies, um, as you can see over 6,000. Um, that number is not, as I understand, not completely inconsistent with uh, a, a kind of typical number of funded vacancies that exist at any point in time when you go back. And, and Nick can comment on that. He's got longer tenure in these roles than, than I do, but um, we're, we're always hiring for thousands of roles at any point in time, just based on the normal coming and going of people retiring, new positions being posted, um, et cetera. So we can, we can obviously go back through this and, and, and take your questions um, either now or later, but um, well, maybe, well, let me just keep plowing through and we've got, a, I only think only four or five more charts and then we can circle back and take whatever questions you want, if that makes sense. Maybe go to the next chart. 
Okay, so one of your other questions was a great one. How long does it take to fill a position? Um, that's a question we've been asking for a long time as well. And the answer has been actually, the state has never been able to answer that question um, up until this point. And, and why? Well, first of all, it's worth noting that um, speed has not, we're not designed for speed, first of all. Um, we have a, a very complex set of laws, regulations, collective bargaining agreements, and the provisions that are included there that really are optimized or designed, I think, more for things that you would expect in the public sector, right? Um, accountability, control, fairness, transparency. Um, but it's important just to acknowledge, right, not to um, uh, use this as an excuse, but just to acknowledge that every rule that goes in place to some degree, um, you know, slows the process down, right? So we, we work with that as the backdrop. Now, that said, um, we, the real reason we haven't been able to measure this in the past is because information at the different steps of the hiring process and with all the complexity that we have to administer has been coming from multiple different systems and often is paper-based. So it's being tracked manually, which means that it doesn't lend itself to uh, you know, measuring it in, a, in a, you know, a system where you can get results uh, analyzed you know, with, with, uh, without enormous amounts of brute force. Um, applied to it. Um, and then in addition, we've historically had very agency specific, you know, processes as well. So how positions were managed and how affirmative action requirements were administered and selection processes were done, um, et cetera. Often agencies were doing these in very inconsistent ways, which would again, make it very hard to get consistent measurements around how long things took. So this is another one of the big benefits of centralization is you can apply consistent processes and you can also use technology to um, automate the collection of this data in a way that gives us the ability to measure it and, and measure it more than once in a row, um, you know, because we're, this is obviously something we're going to want to track on an ongoing basis. And so the work is ongoing. We still have a few straggler agencies that are getting with the program here, but very soon, and we think by uh, early next year, um, we will have metrics in place where we can answer that question. We can answer how long does it take to fill a position? And even more so, we'll be able to uh, track that at the individual level, like how long did this particular position take to fill? And we'll be able to aggregate it all the way up to the top. So we'll be able to get to total executive branch. How long is it taking to fill a position by step? You can drill down from there into by agency, by department within agency, by job posting. Et cetera, et cetera. And if you go to the next chart, um, this is just a sneak preview of version one of a dashboard that, that, that we'll have, as I mentioned, in the next couple of months live here. And um, don't, don't look at the specific numbers on here. The data are illustrative um, and not actual, but to give you a sense of where this is going, at the top is just some filters where you'll be able to, and, and this will all be public information, right? Um, so any user can go in and you know, sort by an agency they're interested in or a period of time or a role, and then be able to drill down into that and look, when you look at those, bar, those colored bar charts, you can see for the different steps of the hiring process um, and understanding like which group or agency is accountable for which step of the, pro the process, how long it's taking at each step, both for that role or, or division that you've drilled down into, and then to be able to benchmark that to the rest of the state in terms of, you know, is this good or is this bad? Um, you know, considering all of the, the rules and processes and, and statutes and so forth that we need to follow um, to uh, hire someone uh, in the state of Connecticut. So we look forward next time we talk, um, if that's, you know, early in the new year, hopefully, um, to be able to show you actual data and give you the tools um, and the website where you can go um, and drill down into this question and, and look at this. And this will be really helpful, not just because it's great to have lots of data that we can look at, but it also help us understand more clearly, you know, whether there's certain jobs or there's certain agencies where it's taking longer than it should versus benchmarks to fill roles that we can then drill down and troubleshoot, you know, why is that happening? You know, what are, what are the reasons for it? And in some cases, there'll be very legitimate reasons because, in that agency, in that bargaining unit, there's a different set of rules that create additional steps that have to be followed that take longer. Or maybe it's just, we're not doing as good a job as we could. Um, and we need to you know, look at process improvements, or maybe it's because the job market for that skill is incredibly challenging and that 
means that we need to look at our compensation model or, you know, the minimum requirements that we have, you know, so it just gives us, it'll give us the tools we'll need to, um, to continue to drill down with facts rather than anecdotes about, you know, what's working and what's not working. So we look forward to sharing that with you uh, in the coming months. If you go to the next chart, please. Okay, so on, um, on, on recruitment, uh, retirements rather, sorry, on retirements, um, as I mentioned, um, uh, retirements are a little ahead of schedule so far this fiscal year. Um, and so the numbers specific to that are again, looking at the first four months of the fiscal year, July through October. Um, and again, this is just the executive branch, right? So this does not include um, higher ed or judicial or legislative. So the executive branch that, that this team is responsible for. Um, we've processed so far 689 retirements. Um, for comparison, over the same period of time last fiscal year, um, we processed 568 retirements. So again, a little, a little above last year, um, but not dramatically so. And um, <clears throat> we also have 790 retirement applications that have been submitted for the rest of the fiscal year so far. We certainly expect that number to increase. Um, and, and of course, the big unknown is, you know, how many additional employees will decide to take retirement between now and the end of the fiscal year. So to put those numbers in context, if you go to the next chart, please. Again, another eye chart here, but if you focus in on the, the bottom uh, row, uh, which is the, uh, the totals, um, and my eyes are bad enough where I actually need to look at the other version of this where I can zoom in for myself. But what you can see is historically the state averages somewhere between a thousand and uh, you know, a thousand and fifteen hundred, twelve hundred retirements somewhere in there. Occasionally, like back in 2012, I, I believe there was an early retirement incentive. We got up to 1,800 retirements that year. Um, so it, it, it bobs around a little bit, but it's generally around the 1,100, 1,200, 1,300 per year um, uh, number of retirements in the executive branch. So with almost 700 so far, you know, again, that's a run rate towards about 2,000 plus, which would be higher than historical. Um, and again, the big unknown is um, how much do we expect that to further accelerate. The question is how much does it accelerate? Um, and I think our, our expectation at this point is that we are on track to a year, which is certainly very high relative to historical standards of retirements, but it's probably not going to be, you know, some of the more, most acute scenarios, you know, when you look at the total number of people who are eligible for retirement, you know, we, we never see, you know, uptake approaching that total universe. We don't expect it this year either, but we are anticipating and preparing for, you know, a much more significant wave of retirements than we historically see. Um, you had asked about part-time and seasonal employees. Um, so I don't have a lot to say about this chart other than that we're trying to be responsive and, and give you all the data that you've requested. So we can certainly come back to this if there are other specific questions. Um, and then if you go to the next chart, um, I think your last question was around the, in the HR, um, uh, among the HR employees that were, that are in scope, um, what is the headcount? And so you can see we are down slightly, that is uh, by design. Uh, we know that there is opportunities for efficiency in, in the standardization that we've applied. Um, we've seen attrition of 78 uh, and we have seen 56 hires and we've been actually been really thrilled with the quality of the hiring that we've been doing, the diversity of the hiring that we've been doing has been phenomenal. Um, and uh, getting a lot of great talent into this function uh, as, as we go. So uh, with that, there are questions. Um, if people are interested, there is a backup deck, um, which I will not go through, but provides a lot of additional context into what was inherited prior to centralization and the kind of unsatisfactory state of affairs that we had in many of our agencies at that point in time that we've cleaned up. Um, but let me, uh, let me just stop there and uh, open it up. And uh, my colleagues and I, I'm sure would be happy to uh, take all of your questions. Um, thank, thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, and um, uh, I have uh, one question to begin with. When we're looking at the number of employees that we're hiring, we have seen a steady decline um, in um, employees. As a matter of fact, in the last FAR report, the Secretary of the Office of Policy and Management said that we were down to about the 1950s level of state employment. Um, so that is illustrative to 
uh, where we are hiring uh, to. So if we're hiring at, if our hiring is higher, where are we now? Do you, do you know uh, where we are relative to the uh, number of employees that we've had over the last decade or so? Um, do, you, do you have a chart that indicates the comparison yeah, you know, in the in the executive branch, um, which is again all the data that we've been showing here is is what is what is included right. there. Um, total employment has actually been quite stable over the last several years. You know, right around that thirty thousand uh, mark. Um, so we have not been declining dramatically in total executive branch employment uh, over the last several years. So um, all of the hiring we've been doing, which is above average historically, as I mentioned, has been compensating so far at least for you know, above average retirements that we've been seeing. Now, again, we're anticipating those retirements to go up further. Um, so we are anticipating that we will need to hire more. But again, it's also important to remember that this is very different from agency to agency, even departments within agencies, right? There are some areas where we're attriting faster and we need to, where we have much more work to do to hire. There's other agency, there's other departments where we can come down more because we are providing you know, better services, more online services, people can self-service much more effectively. You know, we don't need as many people doing manual work. Um, so it's a mixed bag when you look across agencies. So if you could ask um, someone that, if they could bring us the data, say um, over, in where where does our total number of executive branch employee, employment count against say the, the three decades, the 1950s, the 1970s, and the 1990s, so that we could have a general idea. Um, Representative sure. Walker? Uh, uh, Senator, we, we will uh, we'll certainly send you that data. I can I can just confirm, you know, Nick's texting here, but we've, we've been at about 30,000 employees since 2017, just as reference, but when we can go back to, <laughs> I would caution though, I don't think there's any value in comparing ourselves to what we were, you know, in decades past. I mean, the tools that we have at our disposal, the nature of the services we are providing, I mean, it's complete apples and oranges. So I, I'm not, I, I would urge extreme caution in doing any kind of comparisons, even more than five or 10 years ago, let, a, let alone decades ago. Well, the reason why I'm asking that question is often the state of Connecticut is uh, said that they are employed, that they have a number of employees per on a per capita basis, much more than other states. And I, I don't find that necessarily to be true because the question uh, that never gets asked is what's the difference between us and count and those states that have county government. And uh, then there is a section that talks about how expensive a state employee is on the executive branch, which says um, when they uh, include in that calculation, us paying down the debt on the unfunded liability that until Governor Malloy, we were not paying down on. So I just, you know, I think that um, it provides me with some data on those talking points that have to be answered. So I just wanted that. That's why I, I, I don't disagree that we do things differently than the last decades, but there is value in understanding how much we have done to change around state government uh, over the last decade and a half. So um, that that's why um looking towards those numbers is helpful. Absolutely. In fact, there's a there's an article in the Hearst papers today, many of you may have seen very related to this discussion where the reporter when he interviewed me last week, I made exactly the same point you did, Senator, which was, you know, how do we compare to other states in terms of the numbers of employees per capita? And I said, you really can't because we really don't have a county form of government in Connecticut where many other states do, where a lot of the activities that we provide at the state level happen at the county level and it's apples and oranges. So I may, I completely agree with you. Um, so, so that's why I want the data, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Uh, Representative Walker. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And thank you for, um, for, for providing us with this. We, we've been looking forward to this because we're, we're all sort of trying to understand all the things that um, that are going on with the transition from, and, and I agree with you having a lot of little human resource agencies throughout the government makes it very complex and, and also uh, has a lot of error for, for accounting. Um, first, uh, I wanna ask <clears throat> what agencies are not accounted for in your sheets? Because um, 
I, one thing I do know is that um, people, I, I don't think that the Board of Regents are on here. I don't think judicial is on here. Who else is not on here? That's correct. Board of Regents, uh, Yukon, Judicial, and Legislative Branch. And Legislative Branch. Uh, okay. else should be included, yeah. Okay, all right. Because, I mean, we, we've heard the numbers all the time about, about 30,000 employees, 34,000. And then we look at these numbers, they are far different from that. And that's because of the, the missing agencies and that. Um, I first want to thank you for all what you did for, for COVID during this whole process. Um, you have done a, a yeoman's job in trying to really help us get control of what was going on around the state. So I thank you on that regard. I want to do that. Um, now, in looking at this, the reason why we are, at least I'm hearing concerns, is how long it takes for things to be processed. Um, we've had some 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 items that we put in the budget this past year as Senator Austin said, but those things have sort of come to a, a standstill in order for it to, to be accomplished. And it's usually based on the fact that um, they can't hire the people in time. And I know you, you had down here the, the fact that it's hard to figure out how long it takes for us to hire people. Um, at one point, I know when we were a uh, long time ago, when we were talking to DDS, we, we actually went through the process with DDS to find out why it took so long. And part of it was the application process and all that, and everything was pencil and paper and things were getting lost, et cetera. So I obviously, with what you're doing now, that's not going to be part of that factor. But when we start programs um, or even try to get information on, and I'll go, I'm, and I'm, Trust me, the agencies are not coming back and complaining. Um, they are saying, we're doing, we're doing everything, we're doing the best we can, but um, our staffing is just very low. Um, but we ask for different things like um, DSS for um, doing a, a, a spa amendment. And it's taken over six months for us to get to that spa amendment. And it's because of the process. And I know that normally takes a long time, but it seems that it's taken even longer. In State Department of Education, um, in trying to get the numbers on the CARES Act, how the distribution has gone on, and some of the other numbers in there, that's taken a long time because of the limited staffing. Um, when we ask OFA for um, information, they come back to us and say, well, there's their staffings are down in OPM and a variety of other areas. So that's why I think we had this, this, this real concern about how long does it take for somebody to get in there? And how are we, if we're having a hard time as state legislators, anybody outside of our fishbowl is I'm sure having a hard time trying to adjust to or even get information. So how do we, how do we work with that? Um, what is in your scope that's going to resolve that problem in us trying to get information. Absolutely, no, as I mentioned, it's, it's an area that's been of significant frustration to all of us um, because it's not, it's, not, um, it's not helpful to try to manage an organization as large and complex as the state of Connecticut based on anecdotes, right? Yeah. We, need, we need facts. And the old adage that you, you can only manage what you can measure is, you know, is, is uh, withstood the test of time because it's true, uh, largely. And so, you know, getting to the point where we will be in the next couple of months where we will have facts and we will have actual data around how long it's taking to fill roles at each step of the process, right? So we can drill down into what can we do? What is, where, what are the primary areas that are taking the most time or, or we can then start to make assessments around, you know, what, what levers could we pull to make this go faster, right? Are there certain regulations? Are there certain elements in our collective bargaining agreements? Are there certain laws which we should relook at because they, you know, the benefits versus the costs, you know, don't make sense um, or other process improvements. The, the backdrop for all of this though, I think it's important just to, to recognize is that Almost every employer, certainly every employer I've been talking to over the last several months, probably many of you as well, are, are struggling to hire people as well. I mean, it is a very, very tight labor market. 
particularly in the areas where we are struggling the most to hire people, mm -hmm. uh, direct care positions, right? Uh, nurses, doctors, um, technology jobs, right? These, these are skills that are in exceptionally high demand across the board. Um, and so we are not immune um, from the market forces in the labor market right now either. But again, that's just our challenge to overcome that and to make sure that the jobs that we're offering in the state of Connecticut are sufficiently attractive um, that we can compete, you know, with the, with the other big and small employers, not just in Connecticut, but increasingly around the country in an era where people can telework for a company almost anywhere in the world. Uh, many companies now are willing to hire people who will never come in the office and, you know, work remotely 100% of the time. So, you know, we, we have to be competitive across all those dimensions. And that's, that is something that we're very focused on. I, I agree with the, the, the fact that we are all struggling for the same one person out there to, to hire. I, I worry a little bit about the, and I know I'll get calls on this, but I worry about the, um, the direction of having less people in the office and more people working remotely. Sometimes that makes it even more cumbersome when you're trying to get answers and things because you can't really talk to anybody on a phone. Phone really doesn't always, sometimes you need that face-to-face that, that -face or, or at least that one person directly. So I worry about that. My husband has his adage. He says, you know, if you can't lift the hood, you're not sure what's going on in the engine. So if we don't have a way of communicating and seeing the people that we're talking to, how do we know what's happening and how we're getting things processed? And that's part of the, the issue. So the agencies that have the most direct report to the public or agencies like DSS, DCF, SDE, um, Judicial, those are the ones that I worry them, and DDS, those are the ones I worry about the most because that, is, if you're not part of our system, then it's very hard for you to work through it. So those are the ones that I think we should focus on, especially because they serve a real purpose out there for us and for the people of the state of Connecticut. Um, and, 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 and like, but when I looked at like DOL, in your positions, Phil, DOL, you have, and am I reading this right? So DOL has right now, as of, as of 2021, 363 openings, or is that, um, are those uh, vacancies? I'm trying to read your chart. So if we are on page five, which was yep. the fill mm -hmm. the current vacancies and go Sorry. across DOL line, mm -hmm. um, we have uh, filled 178 roles so far this fiscal year. We're on a run rate to fill uh, 534 and they have 89 approved vacancies. All right, so are those also including the, the um, transitional, no, the seasonal um, employees too? Because I know we hired a lot of people to try and address the unemployment numbers that, and processing, especially right now because we're being audited in, in one way, shape or fashion. Is that the number that, that you're looking at? Is, are those seasonal in there too? Nick, do you know the answer to that? Does that include the, some of the temporary staff that's been brought into help support the surge? Yeah, yes, it does. So that 89 figure are all approved vacancies currently in core CT. Um, that's all the, the positions that the agency has requested and that um, OPM has fully approved. Um, it, you know, obviously this, that number fluctuates. Um, mm -hmm. So we, you know, we did it as of 11.1. Um, new requests are put in by agencies um, almost daily. So, um, you know, that number will change this year. Mm -hmm. But the short answer is yes, that at any position, regardless of type, uh, FTE level mm -hmm. um, that's approved, that, that's what that number reflects. So does that also include the federal portion of the employees that we have incorporated in that? Yes, this is blind to source of funds. This is just approved position. Approved, uh, that's approved positions. Okay, all right. Because the, the other question that I have is, we look at those numbers when, um, when we do budget. And so we, we look at filled and unfilled, and, and then we help calculate that. So in looking at DOL, we're saying 
that there are officially federally and state um, 363, no, 178 and 534, correct? Correct. And, it, you know, just by looking at these numbers and the run rate that uh, that is there uh, against how many positions are improved in core, it looks like the agency will have to be asking, requesting more positions of OPM through the process here for the rest of this year. Okay. The reason why, when we when we do the budget, because we're going to start that process in, in, in the next session, we also look at the positions that OFA has both filled and unfilled. And right okay. now the numbers don't jar up at all. And so that's why I'm looking at that because that, that, that stands for dollars in a budget and in, in an agency. And sometimes we, we use that as a way of, of cutting back, but I'll, I'll hold my rest of my questions until somebody else I'm sure will ask mine. Thank you so much. And I'll wait and see if I can get in one more question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Representative Dathan, followed by Representative Dillon. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Commissioner Jabal. This was really helpful um, in giving us some light on this. I know this is something that we're all been thinking about since uh, we met and talked about this earlier this year. Um, I'm delighted to see your dashboard. I think that is going to be a really strong tool to help manage the situation. Um, one thing uh, I noticed that there wasn't anything on there about any sort of salary data kind of level of hire. Did I miss that or um, is that going to be in the, the final version of the dashboard? Um, the dashboard is really gonna be designed around measuring the time in each step of the process, but certainly for every one of those positions, you know, the salary information is available. Um, uh, in fact, posted on the open data portal. Um, but Nick, any, any other comments you'd want to add there? Uh, thanks, Josh. Uh, I would only add that um, some of the detail uh, that, that's uh, being mentioned here will be in the position detail. So if you were to look at the draft dashboard at the bottom right-hand corner, um, there is a link uh, that um, says detail uh, in there. And uh, really what we're working towards is to have that be a, um, a link that you can go to a separate page that as Josh explained before, will essentially be the um, all of the positions um, that are in play. Uh, and so you will know um, the job classes uh, that are being requested, which then will have um, information associated to that job class, like salary level and, and, and so forth. Uh, so um, the design of this uh, really has been around measuring um, from end to end the, the speed of the process, but we, just by virtue of this, uh, of this extra information, um, we can access you know, salary and, and things of that nature. Um, thank you. In terms of, um, is there a process in place that if a hire is taking a long time that um, we use maybe recruitment agencies or we look at the compensation levels um, and um, is that going to be part of this um, kind of overall evaluation of the dashboard? You want to keep going, Nick? Sure, uh, absolutely. So um, maybe just to um, uh, reiterate some of what Josh mentioned before is that the, the facts that we will glean from this dashboard will help us do the, the very things that you're mentioning here is that it will provide a foundation for us to um, speak with agencies with much greater precision than we can now on any problems that um, are faced. Um, it will help us with any insight in terms of uh, inefficiencies of the process um, at, at certain points, whether it be in agencies and the process itself. Um, and then when you have those conversations and drill down between HR and agencies, um, it's, it's certainly conceivable that we arrive at 
um, other levers, levers that we're going to have to pull, like, for example, the compensation level of a particular job class that's driving um, the performance uh, through the process. So, um, you know, I, I really what you are um, asking here is a key goal of this dashboard is to be able to have those kind of conversations. Okay, great. I have, I know I've answered, asked my two questions, but I'm going to put my hand up again and hopefully be around for round two. Thank you so much for your response, Nicholas. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Dayton. Um, Representative Dillon, followed by Senator Armour. Thank you very much, Senator, and, and thank you, Commissioner, for the detail you've provided and, and also for your leadership on the astounding number of details <laughs> that, that were necessary to pay attention to during this pandemic. I, I guess my question, and some of it has to do with your department and some uh, OPM, um, is the, um, the lack of clinicians in state service uh, either directly as employees or, or contractually. And that, and that spans departments. I'm, I'm thinking right now of, well, the department that was mental health and addiction, although worrisomely, uh, Lee, uh, addiction has been put into DSS and I don't know what that's gonna mean for us, but uh, the, um, who is in charge of, the, would it be you? of developing a strategy for recruiting uh, clinicians, whether they're going to be um, in state service uh, or, or whether we're going to be funding them elsewhere, given that you know they're coming out saddled with student loans and, and hundreds of thousands of dollars were held back in mental health and addiction by OPM after we did the budget. That was part of the forty-three million dollars that was held back. So, um, I'm concerned about the the disorder that that may create, and and whether are you the person who would be in charge of developing a strategy for uh, attracting clinicians to deal with mental health in particular, but also we have uh, substance abuse issues out there. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Um, a couple of things, and, and then uh, I want Nick to comment as well. But first of all, just to be very clear, hold, any previous holdbacks are not in any way constraining Demis's ability to fill roles right now. Um, we are filling roles as fast as we can possibly find qualified people for the openings that we have, and there are there is no constraints placed on that based on any prior holdbacks. Um, you know, with regards to hiring. Uh, clinical staff into those roles, which we completely agree with you and it is, it is incredibly challenging right now. Um, we are going to a number of extraordinary lengths. I'd like Nick to kind of step through some of the actions that we're taking, but um, in, in terms of your direct question about who's responsible for that, it is a partnership in all cases. So it's, a, it's always a partnership between DAS, where we have kind of the functional responsibility for HR and recruitment, but um, in partnership with agency leadership as well. Um, you know, they, they own the positions. Um, and, and frankly, in, in today, you know, it's been this way for many years, but, you know, we've been a little slow to embrace this. When you're out in the market hiring in competitive environment, generally the candidates want to talk to the, the people who have the same skills that they have, right? The people that they're going to be working alongside of. Um, you know, nothing against our HR team, but oftentimes people are less interested in talking to the HR folks or the recruiters, they want to talk to the actual people who speak the language, do the same work that they're going to be doing, people who are going to be their boss when they get started, et cetera. So we're, we're trying to shift the culture as well to ensure that those folks where they have historically not been as involved consistently across the board, this is not a statement specific to Demis, but um, generally speaking, um, getting them more involved as well and actively participating in the recruitment process, because that can really make a difference. Um, but Nick, you want to talk about some of the additional specific uh, actions we're taking with Demis? Certainly, thanks, Josh. Um, so just, we've added uh, some new uh, tools and practices um, by virtue of HR centralization that the state's never had. So we have, um, we had the ability to organize and um, outfit really the state's first ever centralized um, recruitment team that one of their core functions is external outreach. Um, and 
Additionally, we've been able to uh, provide that recruitment team with um, the most advanced version of LinkedIn recruiter that, that is out there. So our folks have um, licenses and they have the ability and are actively on a daily basis reaching out to passive candidates. So in other words, um, folks who are not actively looking for a job, um, folks who are out there and, and, and working, um, we are reaching out to each and every person in these types of occupations on a regular basis and uh, gauging their interest to work for the state of Connecticut, leveraging um, all the great things that, um, that are available to them as a state and employee and how meaningful our work is here at the state of Connecticut. So um, we, are, we, we are more aggressive now in our outreach um, to passive candidates than ever, ever before. Um, and we have a unit that's dedicated to doing this on a daily basis. In addition to this, and to um, just add to what Josh said, a big part of that is when you venture into the world of active, actively recruiting passive candidates, um, Josh is 100% right that there's only so much a recruiter or an HR person can do. There's a certain point where um, particularly professionals, um, whether you're talking in various STEM roles or uh, in the clinical world, they want to speak with peers or potentially people that they would be working for. Uh, and so we are devoting, uh, and for the past year uh, we've been doing this and we will continue to do so, is our HR teams and our recruitment teams are actively linking up hiring managers in Demis and other agencies that are similarly situated um, we're getting them uh, LinkedIn accounts for the first time. So we're, we're getting our hiring managers and leaders on social media for the first time. We are bringing them to career fairs. We are, um, it, whether it's on-site or digitally, we are introducing, we're making introductions between hiring managers and passive candidates um, that are out there in the world. Um, and so, we are continuing to leverage this. Uh, not only that, but I mean, we are, our social media and digital recruiting campaign is um, a hundred times what it was five years ago. And before 2016, there was nothing at the state. Like we had zero um, of that activity going on. Uh, so if I had to sum up our strategy, number one is digital. Um, huge um, social media presence. Number two, it's pursuing passive candidates uh, through LinkedIn Recruiter, of which there are thousands of um, employees on LinkedIn in the roles that we are competing for out there. And then number three, it is that fostering and building that partnership between recruiters, hiring managers, and prospective candidates. Thank you. Uh, I I um I did highlight Demis because of the holdbacks and and the cut to a private and to the state PS line. But at the, at the at the state level, it spans departments, right? It includes DOC. It includes DCF. Uh, at the population level, our communities have people with needs, and there's a mix of providers. And ironically, the state is very often a rival to the nonprofits that we've been flat funding. So they could train somebody and then that person that you've nurtured, and this happened to me when I was a director of a shelter, gets hired by the state and, and at a better salary and they have huge loans to pay and wow. you know, what can we do? So uh, it, this is an ongoing conversation and I know it's complicated, but, uh, but there are a lot of moving parts, as we say, uh, in the building. And, uh, and I hope to continue the conversation on where the money goes and, and how we're seeing the needs in the community, uh, which are increased. Thank you. Absolutely, and thank you. And uh, maybe uh, Eleanor and Nick, if we could share the the links to our uh, social accounts uh, with committee members, to the extent you're all willing to follow those and amplify them. You know, we post job openings there. And so those are opportunities for your constituents. If you can help us get the word out, um, that can only help. And uh, it's a nice service, uh, perhaps, to provide your constituents as well. 
That was, that's a great idea. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you, Representative Dillon. Um, Senator Anwar. Thank you, Madam you Chair. <laughs> and uh, uh, thank you, Commissioner, for you and your team for the hard work uh, for the presentation today and also the hard work uh, uh, through the pandemic as it continues on. Um, I, I wanted to just uh, share a perspective. I, I know within our responsibilities for employment in the state, every single employee is critical. Um, I would like to suggest that uh, sometimes the middle management or the supervision roles are a little bit more valuable because an entire division could get impacted if uh, the right person is not employed. And um, when we are looking at these numbers, sometimes that very critical piece of the puzzle is lost. And I, I just want to suggest that maybe it's worthy to look at the supervision or middle management roles within your chart separately and, and also recognizing um, the timeline and anticipation of retirements there. Because uh, again, from anecdotes, what we have seen is that first people don't want to be supervisors because when you're a supervisor, you may not get overtime and, and people would rather be working um, in a ma manner that they're compensated better for their time. And, and then there, we lose institutional memory suddenly when some of the people in leadership positions uh, do retire. So there's a qualitative part to this and I don't want to lose the value of the qualitative part, especially in the supervision level. And, and I just wanted to put that on your radar screen uh, as well. And, and, and the reason I'm also saying that is that when we start to look at timelines, uh, that would result in the uh, feeling that while well, we're gonna look bad in front of the community, if we did not fill that position in X amount of days or months, and then as a result, we will make decisions for supervision roles, uh, which may be long-term detrimental. Uh, any thoughts on, on my, my question? Um, thank you, Senator, uh, for the excellent question. We completely agree with you. Um, this has been an area of significant concern um, since uh, you know, we came in and you know, observed uh, you know, very candidly you know, low levels of morale within management um, have, as a function and in particular of having been excluded from, you know, a number of, um, you know, uh, increases that and, and additional changes that have benefited our represented employees over the last decade, um, whereas uh, historically, oftentimes they were left out. And so we appreciate the support of this committee in particular for uh, helping us include funding in the biennial budget to uh, help right some of the wrongs of the past. Um, and I think people are aware over the summer um, we provided a set, essentially a set of catch-up uh, increases to non-represented employees um, for the increases uh, uh, in, in compensation that they did not experience over the last uh, since the last CBAC deal, um, which has gone a long way in terms of um, not just improving morale amongst um, you know management, but also um, making those roles. I think the spirit, the main spirit of your question, Senator, is. We want to make sure that our best and brightest are attracted to take on positions of increasing responsibility because they are so important. And because in those roles, you can get even more leverage right, out of your top performers in terms of helping to affect positive change in a whole division or a whole agency. But we, what we heard when we came in was a lot, of, a lot of the best and brightest didn't want to take those jobs for all the reasons you described. Right? They uh, have to take a step backwards oftentimes in their career and their compensation. So we've been systematically addressing and fixing those problems. Uh, and we are hopeful that we're in a much better position now that, um, you know, the, the people who want, who are willing to step up, have the skills and capabilities to, to play leadership roles are willing, willing to do that going forward. So it is, we're, we're not done. I mean, you know, we're still doing some analysis around certain areas and departments where we may, even with those changes last summer, still have compression or inversion um, between uh, employees and, and their, their uh, management uh, ranks. Um, and and with, in partnership with Secretary McCaw, we will be looking at potentially doing some additional, more targeted this time uh, adjustments to account for any remaining inequities that, that do exist out there. Thank you so much. And I'm hoping and as we track some of this, we would keep track of it. My second question or a comment was, uh, sometimes we can make the numbers look better. Uh, what would happen is, well, somebody may make a comment that, oh, we reduced the number of uh, state employees by 5%, 10%, 20%, but the contracted uh, outsourced jobs start to increase when we are actually hiring private entities 
uh, doing some of the, the work that was being done by individuals. Um, and and um, to the taxpayers, to the community, and to us as legislators, it gets confusing that, okay, we've lost so many less jobs, but our, our expenditure has not decreased as much. So I wonder in, in, in your, your strategy of transparency, there would be a way to keep track of the contracted jobs that are being pending and then who is going to be the, the group that's gonna be looking at that. So we actually have the full picture uh, from that perspective. Your, your thoughts on that too. Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, first of all, it, I think it's important to mention. I mean, there is not a you know widespread strategy to do what you just described. I mean, we're we're really looking, particularly like in direct care and other critical areas, you know, looking to refill uh, or in many cases grow uh, the employment levels in house of what we have. I think um, with with regards to um, contracted services, to the extent that those services are denominated in headcount. Um, you know, we do, you know, all the contracts are public and, you know, I know on the open data portal, you know, spend contracted spend is, is available. Um, and I, I'm sure, you know, us and OPM are happy to answer other questions that exist. I think it's important to acknowledge too, though, that, um, in many cases in this day and age, um, you know, contracted services are not denominated in headcount. They're denominated in a body of work that needs to get done, right. An outcome that needs to be delivered, um, and in some respects, um, you know, focusing on how many people it takes to do that work is, you know, in my judgment, less interesting or important to the taxpayers than what work is actually getting done with what quality um, and at what cost point. Um, so it's more of a philosophical point, I guess. But you know, to answer your question very directly, I, I, you know, we're obviously happy to provide any any and all data that could be useful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you very much. Um, and uh, I would point out to Senator Anwar that in, in general, we we spend a hundred million. It was in a recent article over the last year or so. A um, hundred million dollars less in salary between now and a decade ago, and a hundred about a hundred million dollars less in um, cost to uh, uh, our medical uh, state employee medical benefits. Um, which I think would make many taxpayers happy, um, relatively speaking. But to Senator Anwar's point, um, Commissioner, uh, one area of very deep concern based on the, you mentioned a little bit about it relative to the infrastructure bill. And uh, many uh, people, Don Schubert, one of those, has talked about the uh, inability of DOT to fill the positions they have. They also have a lot of contracted employees uh, or people that are working under contracts uh, that um, fill the role of engineers and other uh, positions. And that, to me, um, I, I want to make sure that... that uh, and when you say also that state government is sort of slow on things, we should have shovels in the ground in May. That's what we should do. We should, we should be able to build things by the next construction cycle. And um, it worries me that we might not have the staff ready uh, to do this. And seeing as we know what some of those projects are going to be, I would certainly expect by January or February to see RFPs out on some projects to make sure that we are starting to spend these dollars. Uh, do you have any sense of DOT's ability to start putting projects out? That, that particular bill has already been passed by um, uh, Congress uh, and the Senate and been signed by the president. So we know what the dollars are gonna be. Are people gonna be ready to start putting these projects out to bid so that we can start the next construction cycle to get things done? Yes, thank you, Senator. Um, an area where we, we share your sense of urgency and focus on getting uh, moving fast. I'll, I'll one up you even on reasons why Please that's do. important. <laughs> you know, the, there's, a, there's a number of um, pots of funding in the infrastructure bill which are competitive, um, where Correct. Connecticut will need to go compete against other states to access that funding, where speed and this, both the speed and the quality of our proposals 
um, will improve our chances of, of, you know, increasing the amount of funding that we're able to bring into Connecticut. So, you know, Secretary McCaw's already approved um, a couple hundred additional hires into DOT. Um, you know, we are all hands on deck to make sure that they are um, not just them, right? It's also deep, right? There's a lot of permitting work that'll be required here. There's going to be work in the Department of Public Health around um, a lot of the, rec- the funding that's available for um, clean drinking water, for example, um, and other programs. Um, Nick's team, right, uh, you know, has the opportunity to, you know, bring in some additional short-term help here to deal with this surge. So we, we're on it. Um, we're meeting on it regularly with the governor. It is one of the topics I can tell you that he personally feels the most sense of urgency around right now and is calling us all weekend long about. Um, so I absolutely agree. Um, this is a, a really important area. Um, and I, I, I can't I can't emphasize enough that this is something that I think the legislature should be meeting um, at least every two weeks relative to where we are with projects that are being put out to uh, bid and grants that they are applying for. Uh, this is extremely important. And um, I've seen the state uh, oftentimes miss construction cycle after construction cycle, put it by, by not uh, by not getting this, this part done. We have sewer lines that can be rebuilt. And when you build a sewer line, that's a hundred year project. So those lines will be in for another hundred years. Um, uh, uh, water uh, lines, um, these things are things that I think that um, are a, an excellent place for us to start um, getting projects out. Uh, and we're also ha- gonna have to be in line uh, to first claim uh, the, uh, all the necessary material for these projects. And with a supply chain issue, the first ones out the gate are gonna be the first ones that get the product. And if we um, don't make this a, a number one priority, uh, I, you know, I'm hopeful by, by what you're saying that this is something that people are paying attention to, but I have seen people over and over and over again miss deadline after deadline after deadline, putting a project out. Uh, most recently, the Gold Star Bridge, the largest bridge in Connecticut, the, the largest bridge in Connecticut, um, we all know it needs to be replaced on the, on, on the north end of it. And it's going to be a 10-year project. With money coming in, that, that doesn't seem to me to be uh, something that we should be doing. It, we know that um, uh, that product is already being uh, stopped from traveling over the Gold Star Bridge. If it's a permanent load, it's going over the Mohegan Pequot Bridge, which should also be being looked at. Um, and we're moving it so that it, uh, the product for the sub base and electric boat can't go directly over the Gold Star right now, if it's a permanent load. Uh, so I'm hopeful that this happens. Uh, you're a key component in this. Your agency is a key component in this and getting enough um, workers to to do this this job. Um, and I, then secondly, I would like to say, um, and, and I'm really going to suggest to appropriations that we have a bi-week, uh, you know, a bi-monthly um, or every two weeks uh, meeting on where we stand on this issue. And then the uh, to uh, Representative Dillon's uh, point, um, the Department of Correction uh, has significant problems in hiring in the medical and health area. Uh, we most recently uh, did a um, look at uh, uh, where, uh, how many people have mental health issues in the Department of Corrections that are incarcerated, disregarding substance abuse, just mental health issues. And I know the commissioner is looking to refine that data. And we were looking at 80% of the female inmates were chronically mentally ill and close to 30% of the male inmates. When we have that, we don't have enough um, workers for uh, identified workers to work on mental health issues that are of incarcerated folks, that, that, that is uh, going to put a significant drain and it also just encourages recidivism if they have not gotten the appropriate treatment. And if we're going to use our prisons as quasi mental health facilities, we better be, make sure that we have those positions filled. My understanding is those positions 
are not paying enough to encourage people to come into them. Do you have any idea what's going on with medical and mental health in the Department of Corrections? Thank you, Senator, for, for those um, comments and points certainly noted. Um, with regard specifically to medical roles, um, uh, as mentioned, the, the, there, there is a significant demand uh, for talent in these types of jobs, uh, which predictably creates um, uh, you know, uh, demand on compensation structures as well. Um, and that is certainly something we're taking a look at. Nick, do you wanna add anything on that topic specifically? Sure. Thanks, Josh. Um, I would, uh, Senator, every, everything that you've said, um, we agree with and see from an HR recruiting perspective. Um, licensed healthcare roles are far and away the absolutely most challenging roles to fill in state government. It is, it's those roles and then everything else is a distant second. Um, after that, you're looking at, you know, engineers and uh, certain aspects of IT, but far and away licensed healthcare is incredibly challenging. Um, it's uh, fairly well recognized um, within the state here that the compensation structures are a component of it. Um, you know, th those are things that DAS and OPM and whether you're talking DOC or DEMIS, uh, we discuss regularly um, and it's part of um, our negotiation strategy. Um, from an HR perspective, we would love uh, greater compensation uh, for these roles. Um, it, it, it's, we, we are historically lagging behind a variety of our competitors, such as Harvard Healthcare, Yale New Haven, uh, and, and then even many smaller employers. So that's a, a piece of it. Um, and, and you know, this is something that I'm sure you're you're very knowledgeable of and sensitive to is just the, the correctional environment itself. I mean, the the roles that we are recruiting for in DOC are unique. Um, they're not attached to a um, hospital system, you know, that has like a um, a teaching arm to it. Uh, and so, it, it's you're really, you know, you're embedded in an institution working with a very specific population of um, patients and customers. Uh, incredibly tough to sell that on the open market relative to the other opportunities that are out there. Um, to combat that, we work with the hiring managers at DOC regularly. Um, we have used and employed a variety of different um, digital recruiting methods. We have videos. Um, we go to job fairs. We do all sorts of things to try to um, sell the value of these kind of roles uh, relative to the choices that many um, applicants out there have. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would, you know, sum it up by saying it's a little bit compensation. It's a little bit environmental. Um, it's a little bit perception from applicants that we have to, um, we engage with and um, personally and include hiring managers in that to explain um, really some of the, the, the opportunities and, and benefits uh, it is to serve at the Department of Correction. But it, it's, it's a complex problem um, as, you, as I'm sure you're, you're very uh, knowledgeable of. <laughs> And Nick, you didn't, um, I, I know I included two different, very distant, uh, you know, opposite ends of things, but um, I would point out that when the commissioner talked a little bit about DEEP, if we can't get permits done in a timely fashion and it's going to take two, three, four years to get a permit on, that is just going to be unacceptable with this infrastructure bill. We need to get shovels in the ground and, and uh, part of the meetings that I'm suggesting we have uh, would be to make sure that we have enough people and permits and licensors, licensures to get these things uh, out the door. Um, so I think that that's something that we have to uh, really pay attention to. Roger that, Senator, uh, understood and agree. Thank you. Um, up next is uh, Representative Walker. Thank, thank you. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to, I, I agree totally with what Senator Austin was saying, because the other part of that 
equation is like DOC, many of the suits that we've been facing in DOC is because of the lack of health care that they've had. And one of the things that they've underlined over and over again is that we do not pay competitive rates for those positions. So my question is, how are we going to address that? Are you, are you starting to evaluate the, the categories of the positions and looking at what the competition out there is offering so that we have to elevate those, 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 the, the salaries, the basic salaries, so that we can be in competition and provide the services that we need? Commissioner? Do you wanna comment on the process? Uh, sure, uh, um, Representative. So th this is so the short answer is yes. Uh, those things have been done. Um, they are part of the fabric of the state's uh, negotiation process with mm -hmm. um, with eleven ninety nine uh, and CBAC. So uh, it there's quite a bit of information out there that both um, the employer and labor have. Uh, so it, it's. And I, and I don't think we would find anyone that disagrees with you that it's the compensation level is a certainly a big contributing factor to our ability to bring in talent. Okay. And in, in your merger, when you created the HR system, did you change job classifications and expectations for those jobs or where did you just acquire those, the ones that are multiply, uh, which, which the, the many of the agencies already do, but not have equal balancing on how much you pay. So let's say nurses in uh, DOC versus nurses in DPH versus nurses in, in DCF or DSS. Do, did you make one basic uh, foundation for how much the state will pay and make that change across the board? Um, so uh, perhaps to, to start the number of job classes and the compensation levels therein um, were not directly affected by DAS centralizing HR. Um, it, it is, you know, to arrive at the types of job classes we have and what we pay, it is, it, it really revolves around um, a lot of history uh, in terms of the various programmatic needs of agencies in the state over time and um, the reasons for the development of those job classes. Um, it revolves around negotiations and what bargaining units own what work. Um, and for our 1199 classes, uh, you know, it, it also revolves around in agencies and by virtue of many decades of bargaining, we have different um, hourly levels. Uh, so, it, you know, it, so it, it really can range. It's, it's quite difficult to have something that's exactly consistent, mm -hmm. just given our size um, and the different types of operations and the number of different bargaining units that we have. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I, 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 I hear you. So I guess my concern with that is if we can't find nurses to fill the positions, then the next thing we'll do is we'll go hire contracting people. And we will do contracts that pay higher rates than what we offer as a state. So it, 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 it automatically puts a weakness in our system because when you do contracting, and you know, contracting do not have a commitment to the agencies. So therefore we are setting ourselves up to sort of weaken that. So I, I, I don't, um, I don't necessarily, we don't, we don't have to continue this, but that is one of the real concerns that I have that we are not offering competitive salaries that others are offering where we're going to lean more to doing contracting, which then leans more towards an instable workforce. So I, I worry about that. So thank you. Thank you very much for your answers. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Representative Walker, Representative Jason, followed by Representative Nolan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And um, I wanted to ask uh, about some of the um, objectives in the CREATES report. One of the objectives talked about streamlining um, hiring so that we could um, we could facilitate um, the time that it takes to hire people. Um, two questions. 
first question is, will the dashboard be able to um, help achieve that? And second, what are the other measures that you are um, implementing to uh, reduce the amount of time that it takes to hire? A, in particular, I really like the idea of the um, pools of candidates based on classifications like social workers or DOC people, as people talked about. Um, so if you could address that, Commissioner, I'd greatly appreciate it. Absolutely. Nick, do you want to take that? Certainly. Um, so uh, short answer is yes, absolutely. The dashboard we are viewing and anticipating to be a critical tool in us uh, being able to identify um, aspects of the end-to-end -end process to improve. And the CREATES report is obviously a guideline for us on things to look at. So um, we're very much seeing uh, the dashboard and the CREATES report being you know, in harmony uh, and trying to achieve the same goal. Um, so, uh, some of the issues that we face really, it, it, you know, ultimately, it, in my opinion, what drives this overall process is the complexity of all of the requirements and the rules that we have. And so I'll, I'll try to illustrate with an example, hiring pools. Um, it, 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 it's, we, we think it's a great suggestion in the CREATES report. Uh, we agree with it from a practical standpoint. Um, However, the state's ability right now to implement with full force in that direction um, toward jobs that it would make sense to do this, where you have a high population of a homogeneous job class, um, it, we're, we're limited by a lot of our uh, language in our various contracts. And, and, and it's really designed um, that way, again, back to we're a public employer, um, that's heavily governed by negotiated agreements. Um, for many of our jobs that we have to, uh, that, that would, it would be great to have a hiring pool, we are contractually obligated to post every single job. Um, and so it, it undercuts our ability to have a pool. Uh, furthermore, there are fairly robust transfer language uh, provisions in our in many of our contracts and the same bar units that where pools would would make a lot of sense to do this um, and those transfer provisions and the need to individually uh, post and recruit for jobs um, kind of work hand in hand in our collective bargaining agreements so it, it um, that's just one example of we have a number of administrative hoops that we have to jump through to fill a position um, you know, they, they're driven by rules that as an overall organization we've instituted over the years and, and, and arguably for good reason. It's just the reason hasn't been speed. It's been for other reasons. Um, it's been for to ensure that um, our employees have um, opportunity. It's to ensure fairness for who's deciding on and, and who gets what job and so forth. Um, so. Uh, DAS, we work hand in hand with OLR and OPM on, we've communicated what operationally we think are a number of challenges um, and what we would like to see to increase speed. Um, those are woven into our negotiations with our partners in labor. Um, and it, it, you know, to the extent that we can achieve these is really the question. Um, but in terms of what we've communicated and coordinated internally I, I, from the DAS perspective, we're, we're very pleased that we've been get, given the opportunity to share that and, and the partnership with OPM has been great on this issue. So presumably you, um, let's say you have a social worker who applies for a job and you have a whole bunch of applications. Can you direct the people who are not hired for that position to apply for other jobs? I mean, with the whole HR centralization, I was hoping that that would be one of the synergies that you would have. So that, that, that is something that we do today. Um, we do it through our job app system. Um, 
where we uh, redirect folks to apply to other roles. Um, our ability, when we do not have contract language that prevents us from doing this, we do employ exactly what you're um, saying. When an agency thinks it is the right thing or the practical thing to do. Um, so, you know, we uh, recruit for one role uh, in this office and then uh, a similar role in the next office pops up next week. Uh, we will use the same eligible list uh, when we contractually can and are able to do that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Nolan. Um, he just answered one of my questions in regards to the eligibility list. I wanted to go back to what uh, Rep Walker had started talking about, and that was um, the scale of uh, the scale for our employees. Um, do we have a, a, a scale that shows or do you carry a scale that shows the difference in what Connecticut pays their employees versus others in your department? Do you have that scale available? I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Um, would you be able to repeat the, it, please? The scale of salaries throughout um, the country compared to Connecticut um, with what we pay our employees in your, in, in, under your uh, watch. Um, do you have a scale that shows the difference that what New York might make versus what we pay um, so that we can see what the amounts are? Um, we have done uh, research on certain job classes uh, that we can share. It, it's, um, it's not something that is um, comprehensively and regular uh, regularly maintained for every single job here at the state. Um, and, and, and part of the reason for that is it, we, um, we really don't set salary only on, on market conditions or how we compare it. The information is used as a bit of a guideline. It, it really boils down to, and for the vast majority of our workforce negotiations, um, that that's uh, so that's really the why this is not something that's always maintained. Uh, so you don't, you don't, you don't base negotiations off of other states. It's, it's a component of it and it's very targeted when you go through that process, but it's not something that DAS maintains on a regular basis. Okay. Um, is that something that you can look into so that we can see the different scales that are um, at least within the states close to us, uh, New York, uh, Massachusetts, um, uh, just so we know what the scale is that um, others are making compared to what we're making for, for our employees. Um, and the next question would be in the, you, you, you talked about um, administrative hoops and a lot of us feel like you know, the streamlining could be improved a little bit more. So if you could not at this time but, um, uh, send uh, the, the administrator, uh, what administrative hoops are, are challenging for you um, that would uh, better the streamlining um, that we can work on fixing um, and increase the speed when it comes to hiring um, if you can send that information to us so we can see those things so that we might be able to make the uh, adjustments that are needed. Sure, ha happy to do so. Um, just, just to share a, a number of what we will share are things that are embedded in collective bargaining agreements. Um, mm -hmm. So just... I don't, I don't mind looking over those I, I just, because I would... I would hope that the bargaining units would also uh, be willing to change things for the betterment of the workers uh, when it comes to the hoops that we have to go through to streamline and make things better for everybody. I would like to think the same, uh, Representative. Um, that's not always our experience um, at the bargaining table. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna interrupt here. 
mostly because the parties are sitting down at the table right now and I would not want to interfere in uh, different things. So if you could uh, provide that information, Nick, that would be helpful. Um, but um, I think to delve into what is going on right, right now and try to say which side is doing which thing, I think uh, would only create um, an additional uh, uh, stumbling block um, for either the administration or the collective bargaining agreements. And I'm hoping they come up with a, uh, a comprehensive contract uh, by Christmas and I don't want to give one, one more stumbling block. I apologize for interrupting, but I don't want to compare either side um, in a public forum when we have very difficult negotiations going on right now. I, I, I apologize to both Representative Nolan and uh, Mr. Hermes. I just think that that's something that we don't want to get into. Uh, yeah, so. and I, I, I wasn't I wasn't I'm asking. Not doing that. I just know what's going to happen based on what he is saying and what you're saying. I get it. Let him send us what information they have. We can look at that. And if there are changes to the collective, uh, to the administrative hoops, um, Senator Kushner has her hand up and uh, they would most properly be belong before um, the Labor Committee, not before the Appropriations Committee. Um, we had this that step for open positions. I, I agree with us getting the information. I just don't think there's a public forum um, based on which side is right and which side is wrong. And that's how this question and answer has, has been detailed. It's not where we wanna be right now because we don't sit at the table. And I, I'm uh, cognizant of that fact. So I just, um, uh, that, that's just where I am with this. So I, I'm, I, that question is just, from my from my perspective, is not something we're going to continue with right now. Do you have another question, Representative Nolan? Yeah, and, and your your perspective, I understand your perspective, but I was hoping to uh, get that information and 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 talk to a, a reporter in regards to some of those things, yep. uh, not to get involved with the bargaining that's going on now just to have that information for a further uh, a, a date later. Um, yeah, we have 36 I, contracts I, right now. There's 36 state employee contracts up for negotiation right now. Should they settle uh, before this legislative session coming up, they will be settled for either three to four to five years, depending on the contract. And so whatever materials we get would not be involved in any collective bargaining environment because we may be voting on one, hopefully, um, before the uh, end of next session. So I just want to be cognizant of the fact that by asking Mr. Hermes a question, when he said that's not his experience, maybe that's not their experience. It's not for us to talk about whether the experience is there or not. It, it, this, this is not, you know, I apologize again. I really apologize, but we'll have him send us the information and then whatever conversations the Labor Committee wants to have, they can certainly engage in. Um, uh, Senator Kushner, you're you're muted, ma'am. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Madam Chair. I um I want to add to uh, not uh, I'm not I, first of all I appreciate how complicated the system is, and when Senator Austin mentioned the 36 contracts, it really does underscore how complicated it is to manage a system of this size. Um, but I do appreciate the added note, and I want to underscore that uh, sometimes it's not all about speed to which you hire someone, but there are other issues of fairness and equity, and that contributes to morale and retention. And so I appreciate that you said that, Mr. Hermes. And I think that is, you know, it's hard to quantify, but incredibly important. Uh, Commissioner Jabal just spoke earlier about what happens to morale and retention when managers don't get increases. Uh, over a long period of time, and it really does impact the system and our ability to serve uh, the, the public. And so I appreciate that. And I just wanted to add to Representative Nolan's request for information regarding uh, compensation in nearby states, because uh, we know that compensation is one, you know, the amount of salary is one issue, but certainly other benefits that go with salary, like 
health benefits, pension benefits, days off from work. Uh, those are critically important to doing a real comparison of how we stand relative to other states. So if we're going to receive that kind of information, we need a complete picture and I hope that would be part of it as well. But thank you, Madam Chair, that was my only question. Thank you very much, um, Senator. Um, again, uh, CBAC is also up for discussion, so I'm going to leave that conversation alone also. <laughs> uh, if you want to send us some information that you have, but I think the Office of Labor Relations is where some of those items are detailed. So um, if anybody else has any questions they would like us to forward to DAS, uh, you can send them to the administrator. Um, uh, Representative France, I see you're on. Do you have any questions, sir? Or any last comments? Uh, no, I don't. I appreciated the information being provided and uh, certainly the, the questions were on point uh, and uh, brought forward a number of issues that I think uh, would need to be continued to be looked at uh, by DAS as they integrate HR. And certainly the opportunity is there for a greater expansion and a, a change to a more business-like model of how we hire within state government. I think some of the commissioner's comments related to new prospective employees being able to engage with people within their own um, agency that they will be joining uh, is important uh, as opposed to just dealing strictly with HR. So it's a, uh, a lot of conversation that was uh, very positive. Thank you. Um, Senator Miner. Do you have any questions or last comments, sir? And I know Senator Meyer was on. Um, I don't. I don't know if he's still on, but um, I know he had other legislative business that he was attending to. Um, Representative Walker, do you have any last comments or questions? I know she's also doing her other her her other uh, job relative to um, uh, how we all say things. Uh, Commissioner, would you like to wrap up? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I I just wanted to, in conclusion, um, thank the committee for your interest in this topic. It's uh, we live and breathe this every day. We we have passion for this topic and how important it is to our state and the people that we serve. And so we greatly appreciate all the thoughtful questions and comments and suggestions. And, um, you know, very pleased that it sounds like we're overwhelmingly kind of aligned on things we need to be doing, some ideas of um, initiatives we could pursue and just generally the shared focus and, and responsibility we feel for, um, for this area. So we, we really appreciate the invitation and the time to, to take you through the latest here. So thank you. Thank you very much, um, Commissioner. We appreciate you and your staff coming on. And um, uh, I am very, uh, I just want to say very clearly, I'm going to be paying very close attention to the infrastructure packages that we get uh, here. I want to make sure that we're, that we have shovels in the ground uh, in the next construction cycle relative to some of the money that we're getting in. Uh, Madam Administrator, what do we have going on? Oh, wait a minute. Here's Representative Walker. Do you have any last questions or comments, ma'am? I'm, I'm good. Thank you, Commissioner. I just want to thank you for your patience and, and your team. Your team is great. So thank you for, for everything you guys did today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Madam Administrator. Next Tuesday, November 30th, the Appropriations and Finance Revenue and Bonding Committees will have a joint meeting where we will hear from our Office of Fiscal Analysis and the uh, Office of Policy and Management on their fiscal accountability reports. I, I would encourage everybody to read those reports. You all got a copy of uh, from uh, the Office of Policy Management and the, uh, and the FAR report from the Office of Fiscal Analysis. Uh, they're enlightening. Uh, there's uh, a lot of really great news in there and there's just overall good news. Um, but you can always ask the questions on, on things that you see that might, might be difficult. Um, quite pleased with a number of different things that are going on in the state. I hope you have time to read those. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming on today. And, and uh, if anybody has any further questions that did not get answered today by uh, Commissioner Duvall, please send them to 
the administrator and will send them over for written responses. Uh, again, uh, thank you all so much and commissioner, thank you very much. Thank you. Have a happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Gobble, gobble. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. Gobble, gobble.